Dude, I asked Chad GBT, what's the most critical five studies in intuition? It made them all up. What's the most key book on the history of philosophical intuition? It made the book up with terrible on science. But it's incredibly useful as a creative because it's wrong in interesting ways. I'm using it trying to write a science paper. It was a flow blocker. When I first started working with it and I realized how wrong the information could be, I went back to it recently with the hope of using it to try to structure a novel. I don't have any ideas for the structure. I've got like 17 different things that may work. You can start asking ChatGBT questions. How does this relate to this? And it's gonna give you an answer. The answer itself might be wrong, but the computers, the AI itself found it. There's a link there, right? It found connections. That's why you're seeing it. Probabilistically, this connects in this way. That's what ChatGBT tells us. And just finding ways to link it together has allowed me to sort of think creatively about storytelling and the, way, and, and the way bigger plots get stitched together. What it did is it took something that was in a box this big and it expanded the box. Like, it's the same way talking to an editor or a friend about writing a book. Like, I'm not gonna take everything they're saying, but if they can find a couple of connections that are interesting and move me a couple of inches farther along, that's incredibly useful. You see artists are now using AI. If you want to imagine a scene, you can ask the AI, you can feed prompts into your AI and it will draw random versions of, of the thing you're kind of trying to imagine up. It's a fictive scene, much in the way that like a, it producing a fictive history of the philosophy of intuition for me, right? But it's a trigger for something creative off of that. The big fear is AIs are coming for our jobs. Historically, that's never what happens. Automation doesn't take jobs, it changes jobs. If three countries in the world with the highest amount of automation are Germany, South Korea and Sweden. They have the most robots, the most automation. They also are the three countries with the lowest unemployment rates in the world. So the most automation, lowest unemployment. That's the exact opposite of whatever. Oh, the AI is coming for our jobs. That's not what happens. Fact one, it changes our jobs. Fact two, in all of the studies of automation, what we learn again and again and again is fully automated doesn't, isn't affected BMW. Totally automated their entire plant, got all the humans out of the systems, all robots. It was totally inefficient, didn't work. They had to put the humans back in the mix. The winning combination is humans and AI together. Maybe there's some point 30 years, 40 years, 50 years out where that changes, but for the next couple of decades, our immediate lifetimes, it's human and AI together. That's the biggest leverage. And we know that's actually not entirely true. It's humans in flow performing at their best with AI because you get faster information processing sprees. You can think at speed. You can think at scale. These are things you can't normally do. These are things you want to do when you're interacting with an AI pattern recognition is through the roof. AI is gonna find really weird connections between things that are a little freaky. Hey, how? what's the best way for a human to interact with an AI to maximize flow? That's a real question that you can ask an AI. Oh, a machine that says, yes, you're in flow. No, you're not in flow. And if you're not in flow, do these five things and then you're gonna be in flow, right? Um, that would be amazing. In our new work on flow, for example, in our, in our most recent papers, we've identified three or four neurophysiological markers, things that happen in the brain and the body as people transition into flow states that have never been identified before. You could take that information, couple it with all the other biophysical signals for flow that have sort of been detected. We know there's a heart rate signature and a heart rate variability signature. We know brain waves do this and, you know, uh, different times of neural anatomy does this and we see networks do this. We can ask an AI which are the relevant biomarkers. And it's gonna measure three to five things and be able to tell us, are you in flow or are you not in flow? Is there uh, epigenetic heritages that can impact flow proneness? Probably, but that's a nonsensical question right now from a scientific point of view. We couldn't even begin to answer it. But when you start feeding all this data into AI and looking for those connections, we're gonna start finding those connections. Peak performance is essentially a secret cultish thing until 
15 years ago, right? Like from the early Greeks to like now, if you're a coach and you've got a way for your team to win, you're not telling anybody. You're keeping it to yourself. In the Navy SEALs, you're in the military and you've got a, an edge, you're keeping it to yourself, right? This this was the way of, of peak performance, but over the past 10 to 15 years, because of podcasts, the secret's out of the bag. 200 best people in the world, the 300 best people in the world, the 500 best people in the world, are they're all on record. Problem is, 90% of what they're doing is nonsense and 10% is actually right. So you can now feed all these podcasts into a, one of these systems and you can start doing comparisons. What do the top 500 peak performance experts in the world agree upon? What do they disagree upon? What do they think is fringe and cutting edge? And you can start augmenting it with philosophers and psychologists in a way that's never before been possible. That's really, really exciting. If you look at the intersection of sciences, it's all at their own language. Classic flow example is if you're looking at flow in the real world, we call it flow. If you're having a flowy experience on a computer or watching a movie or that sort of thing, the term in media study is, is presence, right? And it was only about like six years ago that the media studies people and the flow people realized they were looking at the same thing. They just had different terminology. This is all over the place in the science of peak performance. Embodied cognition, cognitive neuroscience, altered states, psychedelics, autism, uh, PTSD. So loading chat, GBT, or some version thereof with all of the relevant papers from all of the different fields are gonna translate this stuff into the same language, which is gonna be incredibly useful. One of the things we know in peak performance aging is that having a robust social life is really important, right? It really maintains brain health and staves off cognitive decline. And one of the reasons it matters so much it's like lifelong learning, but when you hang out with your friends, they make you think about things that you wouldn't normally think about. They get in your face about stuff, they argue, they go in weird directions, they say strange things, and it forces your brain into unusual, uncomfortable, slightly situations that stretches your brain. And it, it helps preserve cognitive function, you know, in a peak performance aging context. ChatGPT is sort of doing the same thing. It's like your friends. They may be right, they may be wrong. It's this thing that seems smart and has got an opinion. And suddenly that opinion is in your face and you have to deal with it. And I find that useful. Flow is particularly well suited to work with AI. ChatGPT can help us unlock whole new levels of creativity, which can drive us into flow. Want to learn more about this topic? Check out this video.